Hey everyone. So what I want to do is I want to talk about some tools that we can use to solve certain problems and proofs uh, pretty easily. But in, in order to uh, start that off, what I want to do is I want to talk about my sock box. So believe it or not, uh, sometimes I can be a little bit disorganized and uh, that is a little bit true when that comes to how I keep my socks. So what I have is I have my box of socks, which in here I have all sorts of socks um, in various states of disarray and whatnot, various patterns or color, solid colors, things like that. And, you know, it's not the best system of organization if you care about what kind of socks you're wearing. So what I like to do is, you know, I don't really mind if I wear two socks that don't really match each other. So if I have two socks with clashing patterns, you know, that's fine. That's uh, that's kind of in right now, looking like a fool uh, when you dress up. Is I, I think that's the latest fashion, or at least it's the latest uh, iris fashion. Similarly, I don't mind too much if I'm wearing two solid color socks that are the same color, or that aren't the same color necessarily. The one thing I won't do is I won't wear one pattern sock and one solid color sock because that's just pretty passe. So when I'm getting ready in the morning, what I like to do is I open up my sock box, I stick my hand in there and I try to pull out socks. So what I have right here, I pulled out two socks. One is a solid color sock and one is a pattern sock, which is no good. So now I got to keep on pulling out socks until, oh, look at that. I actually have two solid color socks now. And given that I have two feet, uh, I have enough socks to wear in the morning. So, what I've been wondering is, what is the minimum number of times I need to pull socks out of my sock box in order to get two of either two patterns or two solid colors? So, we can take a look at what happens. Let's say, I have my sock box in my lap right now so I can leave my desk space a little bit open. But let's say, you know, I start pulling out socks, and the first sock that I pull out is a pattern sock. So if I pull out one more pattern sock, then I'm good. And let's say I pull out another pattern sock, so that's fine. So if I pull out two socks here and they both happen to be patterned, that's great. If I pull out one sock here, that's solid. My second sock, oh, that's patterned, so I, I need to pull out my third we have a solid sock. That's great. But what if instead my third sock was patterned? Well, we're still fine because now I have two patterned socks rather than two solid socks, and that's totally fine. I'm I'm okay wearing this uh, tragic combination of socks right here. It, that's not something that super bothers me. So over the years of having this uh, horrible sock sorting system is that I've kind of discovered that I normally at most, only have to pull out three socks. And if I pull out three socks, then I'm guaranteed to either have two uh, plain colored socks or two pattern socks. But of course, given that this is, you know, that I teach proofs and stuff, I wanted to be sure. So I figured what better way to figure out whether that is indeed the case than to try to prove that mathematically. So that's what this class is all about, is we're going to figure out ways of tackling proofs like this, where honestly, it's a pretty small number of possible cases that we can get. So I want to I want to tackle a proof like this where it's like, okay, well, I have two possibilities for each sock that I pull out, and I want to make sure that no matter what combination of socks I get, whether it's solid, pattern, pattern, or maybe pattern, pattern, solid, or anything like that, no matter what I get, that I always end up with at least two socks of the same pattern type. So let's get into it. Okay, so here's the theorem that I basically constructed from the uh, sock box conundrum that I've had. So I'm going to suppose my sock box has either neat pattern socks, and which I've uh, designated NP, or plain color socks, which I've designated PC. What I'm saying is that if I pull three socks at random from my box, then I will have two NP socks or two PC socks. 
So what we have is we have the if-then format of direct proof, so we can actually apply a direct proof to this, but it's not going to be super simple. I mean, we have the assumption that we're going to make, which is I'm pulling three socks at random from my box, but other than that, we don't have much to go on. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to introduce a few tools that we can use in any type of proof that we use. So they'll be applicable to direct proofs, but they will also be applicable to the other types of proofs that we'll be talking about after we talk about direct proofs. So you'll see these come up. So don't worry that these, you don't have to just do this type of stuff for direct proofs. Uh, they, we will be able, and in fact, we will take full advantage of a lot of these types of proofs uh, coming up. So if I'm pulling three socks from my box, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to look at every possible way I can draw three socks from my box. So for example, we can look at what happens in the case where I draw one, uh, two, and three plain socks. Well, obviously I have two plain color socks, so we're fine there. All right, now what happens if I draw one plain sock, two plain socks, and one pattern sock? Well, the first two socks are going to be good, so I'll be able to make a, a, a good pair from these two socks here, and so on. So we can represent these using ordered pair notations, actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent the um, every, I'm going to represent every sock as either NP or PC, and we can look at the set of all ordered pairs. So the proof of this, and what this is called is a proof by exhaustion or an exhaustive proof. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking a look at every possible case, every possible way I can draw three socks. So I'll say, I'll start out the proof by saying, uh, consider the set of ordered pairs representing all of the ways I can pull three socks from my box. So I've written out that set, and we have eight possible ways I can pull three sets out from my box. Uh, the reason why I know it's eight is because each sock has two choices. We have either the sock is NP or the sock is PC. And then if we want to look at the combinations of choosing three socks, that's basically two times two times two is eight. But what we have is we have the set of ordered pairs right here, and we can see if we go through each one, well, this has two of the same type, so that's good. This has two of the same type, so we're good there. This has two of the same type, the first and the third, so that's fine. This is fine here. These two are the same. These two are the same, first and the third. First two are the same, and all three are the same. So then we can say, in all cases, every ordered pair has three, no, sorry, at least two socks of the same type. Therefore, if I pull three socks out of the sock box, then I will have at least two of the same type. Let me move my paper up so you all can see the finish of this. In all cases, every ordered pair has at least two socks of the same type. Therefore, if I pull three socks out of the sock box, then I will have at least two of the same type. This is the really messy QED at the end. So this is all well and good, but it's kind of a lot of work to write out all of these, just write out all of these ordered pairs right here. So 
we can actually break it down a little bit easier by focusing on one sock at a time. So let's say, okay, well, let's consider the case where we, our first sock is NP. Then what? Or, and then after that, in each one, we can say, let's consider the case where the second sock is also NP. Then we don't even need to consider the third case, right? Because if we know that the first two are NP, then the third one doesn't even matter. We have two of the same type. Similarly, if we know that the first two are PC, then we're fine. We don't need to worry about anything else. So what I'll do is I will bring out a new type of proof that will actually let us, uh, that will let us consider the problem in this way and save a little bit of time. So what I've done is I've restarted, so what I've done is I've restarted the proof and I want to talk about a way that we can, the, the way that we can save a little bit of work that I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. So what we want to do is if we want to say, let's consider the cases where the first sock that I pick is NP or has a neat pattern. So what I can actually do is I can write, uh, well, let's say, suppose I grab three socks from the box. Then what I can do is I can say, okay, in case one right here, let's suppose Sock one is NP. Sock one has a neat pattern. Now what I've done, I know I've talked so far in our proofs, I've talked about maintaining a lot of generality in terms of, you know, leaving as little, making sure we define as little information as possible about all the objects we're working with. In this case, I would say, hey, well, don't say what the color of the socks are because we want to make sure that this proof works for all the colors of the socks. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to say, suppose sock one is NP in case one right here. And the reason why we're going to be able to do that is because later down here in case two, I'm going to suppose sock two, or sorry, I'm going to suppose sock one is PC. So I have two cases. Let me zoom this out a little bit. I have two cases. The first case being sock one is NP. And we can consider this, everything below case one, a context where we assume sock one is NP. And then right here, we're going to then suppose that sock one is PC and assume that everything below this is a context where sock one has uh, is only a plain colored sock, not a uh, neat pattern sock. So what we're doing is we're using these cases like this to basically define out every possible uh, value that the sock can have. So because we have a case for both the sock being a neat pattern and for the sock being a plain color, we're actually allowed to do this because then we'll be able to separately handle the cases where the socks have a neat pattern and or a, a plain color. And if there's a third option for a sock, let's say the sock also has, uh, I don't know, let's say the sock has uh, a dollar bill stapled to it, then just, I don't know why I said that one, but we're going to roll with it. What I could do is do case three, suppose sock one has a dollar bill stapled with it. So what we want to do with these cases is make sure that we basically have every single option covered for whatever the cases are defining. So in this case, we want to make sure our cases have every single option for sock one. Now I'm going to do something similar for sock two. We can say case one A, suppose sock two is NP. And then case 1b, suppose sock 2 is PC. So again, we have our complete cases for sock 2. And in this case, now in this context here, 
we have that SOC 1 and SOC 2 are NP. And in this context here, we have that SOC 1 and SOC, SOC 1 is NP and SOC 2 is PC. Then if we want to do the uh, full set of cases, if we want to basically enumerate over all possibilities, we could say case 1A and then I. I'm sort of, uh, there's nothing really specific for why I'm choosing 1 and then 1A and, one and then 1AI. Um, I'm sort of trying to follow like a sort of, uh, I'm basically trying to show like, okay, well, case 1A is part of 1, case 1AI is part of case 1A, and then case 1AII will also be in there. But let's say case 1AI, we'll suppose SOC 3 is NP, and case 1AII, suppose SOC 3 is PC. In this case, we can say SOC 1 and SOC 2 match. In this case, we can say SOC 1 and oops, SOC 1 and SOC 2 match. We can also say SOC 3 and SOC 1 match or that SOC 2 and SOC 3 match. All that matters is that we have at least two that match. So I'm just going to pick SOC 1 and SOC 2 to match. Now down here, case 1B, if SOC 2 is PC, we can say, okay, well, case 1, or sorry, 1B, I suppose SOC 3 is NP. Then we have SOC 1 and SOC 3 match. And case 1B, I, I suppose. SOC 3 is PC. Then we have that SOC 2 and SOC 3 match. So these are all of the cases when SOC 1 is NP. And if we take a look at it, these are all the cases that match with these four ordered pairs that I wrote out over here. And in all of these, we have at least two SOCs matching. And we can do the exact same thing for case two. I won't show that all of that uh, by writing it out, but what I actually have is this right here. So I have actually written out, and I just put this up on Canvas. Um, you'll notice that this is a, a document from winter 2020, but it still applies. Uh, in this class, I did polka dot versus cool octopus. You can think of it as instead doing NP versus PC. It doesn't really matter. But um, as long as you know that there are two choices for each type of sock. So I have all of the cases here, case all of uh, case one stuff and case two stuff. So you can see in this case, I actually did specify socks one, two and three are the same color. I could have also just said socks one and two. But this is how you would write what we call a proof by cases where we've exhaustively shown every single possible case using cases like here. Now you might notice that a couple things. One is that this isn't really any better than the first proof that I showed with the ordered tuples, which is true. It's actually a little bit worse because we have to write out more stuff. Although you could also say that it's more accessible. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is better. But the second thing you can notice is something I briefly mentioned before is that as soon as you hit case 1A right here, we know that both socks are the same type. So we don't even need to worry about case 1AI and 1AII. And same with uh, case 2B in this case, we know that once we hit case 2B, we know that socks 1 and 2 are the same, so we don't need to specify case 2BI and 2BII. So what we can do is we can actually cut down on the number of cases by removing cases 1AI, 1AII, 2BI, and 2BII completely, and just saying, well, then we know that socks 1 and 2 are the same color. So let me show you what that looks like. All right, so here is the proof by cases. Um, note that I still listed this as an exhaustive proof, which it is an exhaustive proof. We're still exhausting ourselves over all the cases that we need to, but what we have here is we have this improved thing where we're talking about only once we hit case 1A, then we know that SOC 2 is polka dot, then SOCs 1 and 2, oh gosh, ignore that embarrassing spelling mistake. 
Then socks one and two are the same color. Uh, in case two B, sock two is cool octopus. Then socks one and two are the same color. Uh, I do not remember making this many grammatical mistakes. That is my bad. I typed this up very quickly after I taught this lecture. But what we have is we shortened the number of cases without really losing any helpful information at all. So we still have a perfectly valid proof and we are totally allowed to do that. So taking another look at this proof, what we have is that cases 1a and cases 2b, really all they are are the cases where socks 1 and socks, sock 2 have the exact same color. So no matter what that color is, if we know that socks 1 and 2 have the exact same color, then we already know that we're good. The hardware comes when socks 1 and 2 have different colors. So what we can actually do is we can simplify this a lot more by making one of our cases sock 1 has and sock 2 have the same color and the other case sock 1 and sock 2 have different colors. So let's take a look at what that looks like. All right, so here's a new set of cases that I wrote up. Case 1 right here, socks 1 and 2 have the same color. And as soon as we know that socks 1 and 2 have the same color, then we can say that the theorem holds. So right here, underneath this case is every possible situation where socks 1 and 2 have the same color. And what that means is that for all of the following cases, we know that socks 1 and 2 actually have different colors. You can think of it sort of like how an if statement works, where if this statement was, if sock 1 color equals sock 2 color, then do this, else if sock 1 is NP, you wouldn't assume that sock 2 could be NP. You would actually know, you would actually be able to know that oh, well, sock 2 must have a different color because we're not in case 1 right now. So if sock 1 is NP, then what we need to figure out is, okay, well, case 2A, sock 2 is, oh, sorry, not case 2A. We already know that sock 2 is PC. So then case 2A here is sock 3, is NP, and case 2B, SOC 3 is PC. And in both cases, we can say, okay, well, in here, SOC 3 matches SOC 1, in here, SOC 3 matches SOC 2. So that's going to be fine. Now down here, SOC 1 is PC, which means that SOC 2 is NP. Then in case 3A, we have that SOC 3 is NP, so SOC 3 matches with SOC 2. And case 3B, SOC 3 is PC, so SOC 3 matches with SOC 1 here. And in all cases, we're still fine. We've covered every possible scenario of ways that SOCs 1, 2, and 3 can, basically the values that they have, and from there, we've shown that in every possible scenario, we have two socks of the same color. So that's great and all, but we still have repeated work because it doesn't really matter. We know that sock one and sock two are different. And even depending on what sock one is, we're still doing the same work saying, okay, well, what if sock three is NP? What if sock three is PC and so on? So really, fundamentally, these cases work exactly the same, and the only difference in between them is what the actual value of SOC 1 is. But really, we know that they work exactly the same way, so it would be super nice if we could just say, well, it doesn't matter what SOC 1 really is as long as they're different. We know that these two cases for SOC 3 they'll it will still be able to match one of these and we actually do have some tools for that but these tools are going to require some careful explanation so please pay attention to this what we have is we have the idea of without loss of generality which in a proof setting, you will often see abbreviated as W-L-O-G, or you'll hear me say we'll log a lot, uh, yeah, without loss of generality. So without loss of generality is actually going to be the tool that helps us condense these two cases into one 
sort of uber case, I guess you could call it. And what without loss of generality, generality does. Specifically, you use without loss of generality when you're trying to combine at least two cases together. And if you want to say, hey, these two cases are fundamentally the same, there's like maybe a few small differences in between them, but the logic really kind of works the same way no matter what those differences, like how those differences actually manifest. So in this case, the differences here is what SOC 1 is, and what that means is that when SOC 3 is NP, in case 2, SOC 3 matches with SOC 1, whereas in case 3, SOC 3 matches with SOC 2. That's the only difference that happens in here. So what we can do is we can combine these with a without loss of generality argument and say, hey, these basically function the exact same way, except for the fact that SOC 1 is PC in this case versus NP in this case. So what we're allowed to do is say, without generality, let's see what happens in case 2. And what that will tell the reader is, okay, well, in case 3, when SOC 1 is PC, the logic is really going to happen the same way. There's, only, there's going to be maybe some trivial differences in how it works out, but I can rest assured that if case two works, then following the exact same logic, case three will work. And sort of like the uh, symmetrical argument thing that I talked about in the last video, this is something you have to be really careful about. You have to know that for sure the exact same logic will happen between the two or more cases that you're trying to condense using without loss of generality. And the other thing that you have to remember is without loss of generality always goes with a proof using cases. It is always used to condense the number of cases that you have in your proof. Um, a lot of people will just throw in without loss of gener generality wherever. So for example, they might say something like, without loss of generality, let x be an integer. And you don't need to say without loss of generality there because we're already being very general when we say let x be an integer. Instead, what without loss of generality might be applicable in that case is if we said something like, let's let be x be an integer. Without loss of generality, let x be even, or something like that. And for whatever proof you're working on, that would assure the reader that, okay, well, whatever logical arguments are going to be made right now, it's going to work very similarly if x is odd. Uh, that's a very sort of abstract example here. What I'll actually do is I'll switch back over to the uh, proof that I wrote up for this problem using without loss of generality, and I'll show why we're able to use without loss of generality there. Okay, so here is the without loss of generality proof example. So what I have is that SOC, I have the first case where SOX1 and SOX2 SOC are the same color. So because of this, we know that there are two SOX of the same color in that case. And then in case two, I have that SOX1 and 2 are different colors. Now, normally what we would have to do is specify, let's let SOC, the cases where SOX1 is polka dot and then where SOX1 is cool octopus. What I've done here is I've said without loss of generality, Let's let SOC1 be polka dot and SOC2 be cool octopus. Now, I proceed with the same cases as normal, where SOC3 is polka dot, SOC3 is cool octopus, and we show that, okay, well, SOC3 is going to match either SOC1 or SOC2, so we're totally fine there. And now, I'm going to explain why without loss of generality is important here. Basically, without loss of generality is letting us avoid having to write out the case three where SOC1 is uh, cool octopus and SOC2 is polka dot. The reason why this is, is without loss of generality is a promise to the reader that case three, SOC1 is cool octopus and SOC2 is polka dot, has pretty much the same logic as case two right here. So you'll have case 3a and case 3b where SOC3 is polka dot and SOC3 is cool octopus, the only difference in case three is SOX1 value, SOC1 and SOC2's values, and which SOX SOC3 matches with. So in case 3a, if SOC3 is polka dot, then well, SOC3 is just going to match with SOC2 instead of SOC1, so that's fine. And if SOC3 is cool octopus, then SOC3 will match with SOC1 instead of SOC2. So we're still fine no matter what. So because I'm able to say, okay, well, these arguments work exactly the same way, then I'm able to use this idea of without loss of generality to say, okay, well, even though I'm specifying SOC1 and SOC2 right here, 
because this logic works for all other possible values of SOC1 and SOC2, when SOC1 and SOC2 are different colors, then I really haven't lost generality at all because even though I've specified this, I've talked about an argument that applies for that that sort of that applies in the other cases here, or I guess in the other singular case. So what I've sort of done is I have like I've made a descriptive I've I've basically outlined the logic that works for cases two and three here, or what would be cases two and three, and then said these are practically the same. So if we just look at it through the lens of letting SOC1 be polka dot and SOC2 be cool octopus, here's the description of how that case will work, and then just know that it works for case three as well. So this is why you have to be really careful about using without loss of generality. You have to know 100% that SOC, that uh, any other cases that you're sort of abstracting away with without loss of generality, you have to know that that logic 100% works. The last thing I want to do is I want to talk about a really common error that I see with without loss of generality. So I already talked about the whole without loss of generality, let x be an integer. And that's, you know, that's an error because it's not necessary at all uh, because we already have that x. If we just say let x be an integer, we still have a very general argument. So you don't need to do that. But this is a really bad error. This is uh, practically a without loss of generality sin right here. So let's say we're trying to show something is true for, uh, say, all integers. So we would say something like, let x be an integer, and then say, without loss of generality, let x equal 3. And then show, basically show that the proof works for x equals 3, and then say, well, then I use without loss of generality, so this proof works for everything. This is not good. You should definitely not be doing this. What we have is we have an infinite number of possibilities for x right here. x could be any integer. And we're saying, OK, well, check this out. Check out this example for x equals 3. Obviously, because we know it works for x equals 3, then we know that it works for every integer. And you can't say that. You can't make an argument that works for one integer and then claim, well, it must work for all integers. You actually have to use your general x right here. You have to use the abstract x and say, OK, well, we're going to show that the argument works for any x. And because it works for any x, then it works for any value we plug in into x. So that's a really important note that I want to make about without loss of generality, is that you can't use that to just willy nilly substitute in values however you want them to, however you want to do it. You want to use it specifically when you are removing at least two cases from your proof. So you have to have you have to have a proof by cases situation, and you have to be using without loss of generality to shorten your the number of cases you need by removing at least two of them. So in this case, we can combine these two cases using without loss of generality. So because we're getting rid of cases right here for a without loss of generality argument, this is okay for us to do. I am just. I just wanted to stress this a lot because it's a mistake I see a lot of people make, and it honestly is probably one of the more dangerous ones. If you try to show a proof of something that says, well, for all x, something about x, and then you try to say without loss of generality, let x be a specific element, that's going to really hurt your grade. So I'm happy to talk more about without loss of generality. We have actually some examples of without loss of generality problems on the homework coming up. so. We'll have some time to practice with that. But without loss of generality, use it carefully. But if you use it right, it's an extremely helpful tool. OK, well, this was talking about um, this was talking about without loss of generality and proof by cases and stuff like that. These are really useful tools for us to use. So yeah, hopefully uh, you know, keep these in your tool belt, especially as we keep talking about new types of proofs and yeah, I will see you all in the next video. Hope you have a wonderful day.